Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to a brand new book discussion on doing sociology. Today, we have with us uh, Dr. Karuna Dietrich Vilenga, whose book, uh, Weaving Histories, The Transformation of the Handloom Industry in South India, uh, 1800 to 1960, uh, was published in 2020 by the Oxford University Press. Uh, Karuna works at Azim Premji University. She has a broad interest in the economic and social history of modern South Asia. Her work is grounded in the history of labor with a special focus on the informal sector. And she's currently working on a project titled The Informalization of Labor in India, Courts as a Site of Contestation. Prior to joining APU, she was a Newton International Fellow at the University of Oxford. And today, of course, we will be discussing her book, uh, Weaving Histories. Uh, so to sort of uh, begin the conversation, Karuna, uh, how have the structures of handloom production in South India been transformed and reorganized since the mid 19th century? Uh, yeah, okay, so that's a big uh, question. And uh, I mean, it involves talking about what the industry looked like in the early 19th century and then what did it look like say uh, in the mid uh, 20th century which is when uh, my book ends um so uh, so yes there was i mean there was a huge transformation so to kind of give an idea a more descriptive idea of uh, how things looked uh, in um, the uh, in the 19th early 19th century which is when i kind of start looking at the industry uh, it it was a very diverse landscape so um the kind of the kinds of cloth that were produced the kind of beavers who produced them um, uh, so uh, so so there were lo lots of different kinds of systems rather than you know one system of uh, cloth production and um I generally in uh, in historiography in history writing uh, one knows more about you know the kinds of cloth that were produced and the kind of weavers who produced them uh, who produced for a uh, external market for the european market and for the southeast asian uh, market so you know we know much more about the weavers who were settled say along the coromandel coast or the western coast and uh, uh, where weaving, you know, merchants were very actively involved in uh, in procuring these cloths and selling them, and in the whole production uh, system, so to say. Uh, so initially, for me, but then I wanted to find out, but what did what kind of cloths did people? ordinary people wear, what kind of, who produced these cloths, how did they produce them, and so on. So, uh, uh, and it wasn't easy finding information about them, because we know that, you know, our archive is pr primarily uh, the colonial archive. So you have a lot of information on what was exported, but you have very little about um, what was produced for the domestic market, so to say. So I had to be creative uh, in trying to find out about all this. And so, I mean, I used um, um, uh, actual textile samples that were collected in the 19th century uh, by various people, uh, but all, especially by Forbes Watson. Um, and interestingly, that was collected because they wanted to copy those kinds of, uh, uh, you know, textiles uh, um, in the manufacturing in, um, uh, in, I mean, in Britain. Um, and apart from that, I looked at, you know, com what is called company paintings, where, you know, uh, people were, uh, the portraits of people were made in series and all just to see what kind of cloth people were uh, wearing. I combined that with a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, data about, uh, say, um, uh, customs data, uh, tax data, loom tax data and things like that to kind of paint a broader picture. And the picture that emerged from all this collation of different kinds of uh, archival material is that um, on the one hand, you know, lots of very ordinary kinds of cloth uh, which were widely used, which could would be otherwise, you know, described as plain, uh, coarse, um, um, durable kinds of cloth. I mean, these are kind of words which are also used in describing them, were woven uh, across uh, the country and across South India uh, by uh, various groups. And these were very, uh, this production was very decentralized. So on the one hand, there were uh, beavers um, who, uh, you know, uh, who lived in uh, cotton producing areas, for example, the Deccan, and there they um, had cotton. I mean, either they grew their own cotton or they, uh, I mean, if they were 
weavers who were not farmers, I mean, who were not uh, linked. So they would get uh, uh, yarn, cotton or yarn from um, from uh, from families weaving uh, from farmer families, and they would weave that into cloth and give it back to them for a wage. So they earned a wage for weaving. So this kind of weaving was very very prevalent, especially in uh, cotton producing areas. Where uh, sorry, earlier I mean I made the mistake of saying that uh, farmer weavers, but uh, usually weavers um, were uh, either specialist weavers or um, there were also a very uh, large population of weavers who were also Dalit weavers who, and the communities whom we would categorize as Dalit today. Uh, in the records, they are categorized as either Parayar or Mala. Um, so, so there are different regional names for them who were otherwise uh, agricultural laborers, but also wove cloth. So, um, and this was a surprising thing that I found in the archive that, you know, there were so many uh, of these weavers who, uh, are otherwise not recognized as weavers. In the census records, they're often just categorized as agricultural laborers. Um, and they were part-time weavers, but they wove considerable quantities of cloth. And often they got their yarn directly from the customer, right, for whom they were weaving. And they also wove for themselves. So, so this, this whole process of uh, weaving for your customer and uh, having uh, you know multiple access to yarn uh, is something that strikes you if you look at the early 19th century now apart from this there were other weavers obviously uh, who either bought yarn from the um, from the market um, and wove cloth and then sold the cloth not directly to the consumer uh, customer but uh, in the local market uh, so these could later be kind of categorized as independent weavers, so to say. Um, and for this purpose, either, you know, they would have had their own capital or they might have borrowed capital. And so this leads us to yet another category of weaver who were more, uh, you know, uh, uh, engaged with merchants. So merchants providing um, capital for yarn to be bought and then the cloth being sold either in the market or to merchants. Now, here there is something um, which I think is important to note, uh, which is that even in uh, the Coromandel Coast and where cloth was being produced for external markets and merchants were actively involved, even there, uh, the usually the merchant who sold yarn was not the same merchant who gave an advance to the weaver uh, for cloth to be woven and bought the, and took the cloth and then paid the weaver a wage or bought the cloth and paid the weaver the value of the cloth. Um, so why I am pointing this distinction out is because um, in some historical studies, a comparison has been made to, you know, this involvement of weavers to what is called proto-industrial uh, uh, production structures in Europe, where the merchant provides you with all the um, resources, including the raw materials, and takes back the finished product and just pays you a wage, right? Um, but interestingly, many historians, including uh, President Parthasarathy and others, have um, made it very clear, and uh, Sinna Parasaratnam quite a while ago have made it quite clear that what prevailed in India was not that system, because usually the yarn merchant was, and the cotton merchants were different from the merchants who commissioned cloth. Um, and why, why is this important? Because um, because this um, because these merchants then had less control over the labor of weavers, right? The weavers had more independence; they had more leeway as to uh, what yarn they purchased, how much they purchased, and how they wove it, etc. And so, actually, you know, there was a lot of effort by the colonial state to break this and to say, you know, we won't give cash advances; we will give yarn advances. And there was a lot of resistance to it. So, um, so coming back to my own story. Uh, there was a there were a range of uh, weaving systems uh, ranging from directly weaving for your customer or for your self use, uh, independent weavers interacting with local markets, um, and then weavers uh, working under or for merchants or taking advances from merchants, but at the same time uh, holding um, greater control over their uh, actual production process. Um, so this was the whole range in the early 19th century. And uh, as I said, the, towards the end of the period, what one finds is that uh, systems have 
changed. It's not that they've become now uh, uniform and re been replaced by a single system. There is still a variety of system, but uh, the striking contrast is that there is a greater, much greater centralization of the whole production process. Um, and here, uh, what I uh, mean by centralization is that, you know, there is a kind of fusion of these different characters of merchants, for example. So you actually now have the uh, master weaver um, or the merchant uh, who commissions the cloth, actually, you know, providing um, not only uh, cash advances, but also the raw materials, uh, prescribing what kind of patterns should be made, collecting the cloth and selling it and only paying actually a wage to the uh, weaver who is involved. Uh, now, Sometimes the weaver wove from their own houses, so it was very decentralized. Or uh, by the mid 20th century, you also see the emergence of uh, what are called handloom factories or handloom workshops, uh, where uh, weavers uh, don't own their own looms, but uh, come and work for a master weaver or a capitalist who provides them not only with the raw material, but also with the looms. And they are basically uh, wage workers. Um, so you find that system also coming and alongside it, you still have independent weavers who are um, using um, their own resources or borrowing money to buy uh, yarn and sell the cloth in um, either local markets or markets uh, further away. So independence weaver, independent weavers don't uh, disappear uh, overnight, right? Uh, but one does see a greater centralization uh, another important thing that you see by the end of the period is because of this centralization, um, there is a, um, I mean, there is a more concentration of uh, weaving settlements. So a lot of it is uh, a movement towards urban spaces. So, um, so for example, the city of Madurai, uh, which was always a handloom uh, center, um, th there is a whole new area that evolves where you know these handloom factories. Uh, get set up uh, across the river. And uh, actually, interestingly, then there are you know two kinds of handloom weaving within the city of Madurai. On the one hand are the weavers who have been settled there for a long time, called coming from the Saurashtra community, one of the communities that I study in the book, uh, who are producing fine kinds of cloth, especially mixtures of cotton and silk. Um, and they all weave in their own houses. And they kind of uh, come under this master weaver um, uh, system where they work, but they work from their own homes. And across the river uh, is this new sector of, you know, um, of small workshops, factories, where the kind of cloth that is being produced is uh, basically um, bed sheets and towels and what you would call more, you know, coarse kinds of cloth. And uh, here are weavers who are coming from other villages from around um, migrating to the city. Uh, working um, as workers, as wage workers, so to say, uh, for small time uh, capitalists. So, uh, so, so this is the kind of um, uh, transformation that you see, the change that you see. And uh, I would just like to highlight one particular, I mean, of course, uh, I uh, explore a range of reasons as to why this transformation happens. Uh, but one crucial factor to be highlighted already now is um, you know, the role played by spinning. Uh, so while in the early 19th century, you find that uh, um, weavers have access to yarn uh, from various sources, either being spun by women in their own households or being spun by women in uh, farming households and then the yarn being handed over or um, yarn being sold by women in small, small uh, markets uh, and being bought by weavers um, or, you know, yarn merchants um, collecting and then selling uh, yarn. So basically, you have different sources of uh, yarn, and uh, that is why they are very interested in also keeping that independence. But with the coming in of the mills and, you know, yarn being produced only by the mills, uh, this becomes much, much more centralized and plays a, a key role in uh, how the whole um, handloom production systems get changed and modified. Uh, yeah, so I hope that kind of gives you an idea of how it was at the beginning and how it was at the end. And we can further deal with also how the, the, the process of change itself. 
Uh, right. So uh, one thing that uh, we also think about is, of course, the role of revisionist historic, uh, historiography. Mm. <laughs> what would you say has been the role of uh, that kind of historiography in putting small scale industries at the center of Indian economic history? Yeah. Um, so, so if you look at textiles and handlooms uh, in the context of uh, the writing of economic history of South Asia, uh, they have always been kind of central to the story in many ways. Um, but, uh, you know, the story has kind of, um, as you enter the 19th century or the 20th century, uh, the story is dominated on the one hand by uh, de by the whole debates around deindustrialization, uh, so the destruction of uh, the handloom industry and the handicrafts and also the uh, so the early uh, nationalist historiography or the Marxist historiography focused on that and um, and on the, I mean so on the one hand focused on this and on the other hand looked at uh, the development of modern industry and the, so to say, the lack in it or the problems with the way um, large industry developed or did not develop uh, in the South Asian context and its relationship to colonialism. So the focus was all on, uh, you know, how many, uh, how the textile industry got, I mean, how the mill industry was set up. Uh, then it also looks into other kinds of industry like mining and coal and steel and all that and discusses the kind of problems um, and why you know the industrialization did not take place in the same way as it did in um, say europe or whatever so 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 the whole uh, whole focus was on large scale industry now both in the case of deindustrialization and in the case of looking at economic history primarily through the lens of large scale industry, revisionist historiography has played a very important role in kind of moving beyond it, so to say. Uh, so questioning the whole uh, narrative as to if there was deindustrialization and everything was destroyed, then why is it that, you know, um, we still have handlooms and why is it that, say, in the 70s, 80s handlooms uh, still, you know, formed a huge uh, proportion of the textile industry. Um, so this revisionist historiography played an important role uh, in uh, shifting our focus to also the the kind of the vibrancy, the staying power, uh, the creativity, and of uh, of smaller scale artisanal. Uh, so people who worked in small scale artisanal. Um, sectors and more than people who worked, it was also kind of looking at the dynamism of these um, systems themselves, pointing to the fact that, you know, India has such a large small scale sector. So how can we ignore it when, um, when looking at the larger picture of economic history? So uh, this has been very important and Tirthankar Roy has particularly played a very important role in, um, you know, bringing the small scale se sector and uh, its dynamism into the story and moving our, uh, you know, uh, moving beyond uh, deindustrialization. Um, so, so there is no doubt that, you know, and following Tirtankar Roy's work and then Douglas Haynes's work, um, highlighting the importance of small scale industry in the economic story of India, there has been a lot of work that then, you know, people have started exploring different kinds of um, industries um, and so on. Uh, so, so it's it uh, it has been very important, and uh, in a sense, people who have written later have also tried to bring in newer dimensions of that story. So, while primarily, uh, initially, the focus was on, uh, say, the weaver capitalist or the you know the artisan um, capitalist, the um, merchant. Um, and the, you know the, the 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 kind of entrepreneurs, so to say, in this small scale industry, um, and their dynamism. Uh, now the focus has you know uh, has broadened out more to say, okay, what about the workers? What about the um, different kinds of artisans involved in it? What about labor and so on and so forth? So uh, definitely, it has led to a flourishing of uh, a lot of important uh, shifts in how we see economic history. Uh, right. Again, uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, 
and if you would sorry yeah. yeah if you would like me to add i mean so this is in the very uh, in the context of uh, south historiography of economic historiography of south asia but if one looks further afield also if one looks at the international context also uh, i think this can be situated in the shift uh, moving away from a single view of industrialization right so um, i mean early on uh, global economic history it was expected you know yeah there is a kind of teleology there is a, a set um, direction in which economies move so they will move from craft production to large scale industry and then you try to kind of look at what are the ingredients and if if a particular country didn't move in that direction then what was the problem and so on and so forth so um but again there there has been a lot of uh, revisionist historiography which has said there is no single path to industrialism why do you expect that everybody had to follow in the footsteps of britain uh, look at france france developed differently uh, there you know uh, people like uh, sable and zetlin and all uh, highlight what they call as flexible um in the uh, flexible specialization so and uh, emphasizing that you know uh, there can be more variety when you are small scale and therefore your industry can develop in a different way and um now there's been a lot of work to see how japan for example um emphasis again uh, prioritized uh, smaller scale uh, developments and therefore you know the industrialization path in that um was quite different so the work of sugihara for example so uh, so there has been a shift from uh, looking at one path of uh, economic development to uh, acknowledging that there might be uh, multiple paths to the way uh, e different economies uh, developed and there might be different ways in which they industrialized uh, so so the south asian revisionism uh, revisionist historic can also be placed in this um broader context sorry i can't hear you you're muted sorry i didn't realize that yeah so uh, how did the modern contours of the handloom industry emerge and what role would you say labor or rather particularly informal labor played in this context yeah so um as i just said uh initially in uh when you know uh, historians started looking at uh, the uh, small scale industry uh, the focus was on uh, the entrepreneur so to say so in the case of handlooms for example the um, master weaver the weaver capitalist um and the and the dynamism the the kind of adaptations they made the kind of new technologies uh, they adapted to the kind of new structures that they put in to that enabled uh, more efficient production um and greater productivity and so on uh so uh so uh, so that kind of and the, also the focus on uh, these kind of smaller entrepreneurs uh highlighted the fact that the indian economy um it, it is dominated by uh, small scale industry so i mean we know that in contemporary india the informal sector is so huge so uh, not only is that more than 90% of labor is in the informal sector but also the informal sector um though there are many ways to define it contributes um very very significantly to our uh, gdp uh, so, uh, so so the study of these kind of small scale industries uh, especially here i would like to highlight the work of douglas haines where you know he studies this this uh, the small scale handloom economy and shows that how it was a, it has formed a very significant part of uh, what one sees as the modern economy um uh, and beginning with the work of douglas haines uh, there is also a kind of shift to say ki, okay we don't need to just look at the entrepreneur and the weaver uh, sorry the weaver capitalist but also we need to look at the other other people who are part of the part of that story and how do they shape the uh, st structure of the uh, modern industry right um, so in the case of uh, douglas haines for example he looks at how uh shop floor dynamics uh, the interaction between 
uh, weavers and master weavers and how they kind of um, uh, how that interaction shapes the uh, industry itself right so uh, so for example the resistance say to so to say, um, say of weavers to come and work in workshops so the, the weavers then you know uh, prefer working in their own homes and having control over their own time um, so then uh, that also shapes how the industry develops so the, the the attempt of the colonial state for example to push for or to set up uh, model factories so to say uh, doesn't work out we was refuse to come and work there and so one can see then this structure emerging where there is a master weaver who is distributing all the yarn uh, but the weavers are working in their own homes and are basically they are wage workers but they own their own loom and uh, they kind of have greater control over their time so so this the shape that the industry takes is shaped not only by the entrepreneurship of the capitalist but it is shaped by how the laborer also interacts with the capitalist um another example would be to uh, you know uh, to take the uh, the kind of um, tensions between say uh, workshop owners or factory owners where these factories do get established and where they do get established uh, it is mostly migrant labor so where there is migrant labor is where the factory system uh, gets set up and there again there is a lot of history of uh, both cooperation as well as conflict a lot of negotiation um which then uh, a lot of back and forth the formation of even trade unions in the 30s and the 40s and uh, this results in um, on the one hand you know there is a push towards big, forming bigger and bigger workshops right bigger and bigger factories where there are more number of looms uh, but because of the kind of unionization amongst workers and then their push to have better working conditions or their push their demand for labor laws to be uh, applied to their factory spaces and the resistance then by the merchant capitalist to that um, actually leads to uh, the size of these workshops becoming smaller and smaller in order to avoid you know the scrutiny of the state or labor legislation and so on and this is something that Douglas Haynes has pointed out in his own work and i've um, found in my work and i've kind of then gone on to explore more the um, the impact that this kind of legislation and labor politics had on shaping the kind of uh, you know workshops because otherwise you know there is uh, even within revis revisionist historiography and even within say the work of Tritankar Roy at, there is a kind of teleology that um, it, it gives importance to handlooms and says uh, that you know look at their dynamism but again there is a teleology as to okay handlooms then will become uh, decentralized power looms right so there will be a certain mechanization and then you will uh, go to a different kind of industrialization, but you will, I mean, that is where you will lead. And it's somehow it's a kind of organic kind of um, uh, process. Uh, whereas when one looks at all the other actors involved, uh, the weavers, their families, uh, the kind of trade unions that they form, uh, the kind of resistance they put up, and also the everyday interaction between on the shop floor. When we look at all of this, one finds, no, uh, there, there is a multiplicity of the kind of structures that emerge and they emerge because of the interaction of these uh, various actors who are involved, which includes the uh, merchant capitalist, the weaver capitalist, the, um, the, the weaver, the worker, the family, the state, uh, larger economic uh, influences like, uh, I mean, global trade um, or the production in the mill. So all these different factors uh, interact to uh, you know shape um, shape the final outcome of uh, the modern uh, handloom industry. And again, I just want to emphasize then that there's not one outcome. There are different outcomes, and they are all shaped by the uh, different ways in which all these factors uh, interact with each other. So, I mean, um, I actually take inspiration from the work of uh, Tessie P. Liu, who has worked on handloom weavers in France and Douglas Haynes, amongst others. Um, so they have kind of emphasized what happens on the shop floor, right, between the, um, the owner or the weaver capitalist and 
uh, the worker or the weaver. Uh, whereas I feel, uh, you know, you need to look at all these different factors uh, without necessarily prioritizing one factor and or look, or looking, prioritizing the shop floor and looking at everything else as external factors. Um, I feel, you know, you need to really uh, try to understand the conjuncture of uh, these various factors and how they interact with each other to shape uh, the uh, modern handloom industry. Right. Uh, Karuna, uh, I sort of also want you to talk a little bit about how, you know, two very important and critical factors, which is caste and gender, how did they shape the contours of the uh, handloom industry during the period? So if you could uh, talk yeah, about sure. that. Uh, sure. So, um, so first taking gender, um, the, I mean, uh, handloom industry uh, in the early 19th century was basically uh, organized around the household uh, and around the division of labor in the household or in many households, not, not necessarily in one household. So there was the household in which uh, the many households in which spinning was done, uh, there was the household in which the weaving was done. Um, and, you know, women were central to this uh, labor and um, gender was central to how this labor was also divided. So if you take spinning, uh, which in many ways was the, so to say, I mean, in, in, in a lot of work, it has been kind of identified as the bottleneck. Um, on the other hand, you can also look at it as the greatest value to the cloth, to a finished piece of cloth, is added in the process of spinning, not in the process of weaving. Uh, because, you know, almost four to five spinners have to uh, work in order to provide enough yarn to produce a final piece of cloth, say something like a sari. Uh, so these are all estimates, obviously it depends on uh, the length of the cloth and the fineness of the cloth and so on. Uh, but there are a lot of calculations to show that even for the coarsest cloths, but definitely for the very fine cloths, uh, if you break down the cost of to make the cloth, the huge chunk, some uh, 60 to 70% or more of the value is from added from spinning. Now, the, fa the, uh, the factor is that, you know, this value is distributed among so many women. So it doesn't mean that, you know, women were wearing, earning lots of money from spinning. Uh, but this, you know, even when women were paid much less, uh, this uh, money was so distributed among uh, so many women. And so this whole spinning was uh, located in the household. Almost all women spun, except women, uh, at least in South India, or except women from the Brahmin caste and maybe a few other uh, higher castes. Otherwise, all women spun. So there are, I found even evidence there, you know, uh, even um, Nadar women whose, uh, I mean, whose families were mainly involved in toddy tapping, you have, you know, descriptions of women spinning. Uh, so it, women in all, and especially in farming households where uh, cotton was grown, this was a very important way in which um, value was added. Um, and uh, there is also evidence to show that, you know, this, um, this money that uh, women got from spinning, which was cash, um, though it might have been, you know, you might dismiss it as a very small income, was absolutely crucial to the family income. And it was also often very crucial to the tax that was paid to the state because the tax was to be paid in cash. So there were not so many other cash incomes. So there is a report by Mundro, for example, which, which shows that, you know, this uh, money earned from spinning was a very important factor in the money that was paid for tax. And as I said, almost a lot of this spinning uh, was uh, done by women and it was integrated into their everyday the rhythms of the household and as well as the, uh, you know, seasonal rhythms um, of um, different communities. Uh, now, um, as far as weaving is concerned, uh, sorry, in spinning, there were also male spinners, uh, but uh, uh, male spinners were usually specialist spinners and you I mean at least what I have found is that you find them in greater numbers in along the coast where you know weaving is a, a full-time profession, profession and um, those specialist spinners then wove, spun, spun very fine kinds of yarn and they came from the parayar caste who are a dalit caste uh, 
सो दे वर लैंडलेस एंड आई मीन दिस वॉज देयर लाइवलीहुड सो टू से है ना एंड इवन इन नॉर्थ इंडिया देर इज देर इज देर आर रिकॉर्ड विच शो दैट द फाइनेस्ट यान वॉज स्पन बाई डेट्स हु आर अगेन दलित कास्ट एंड देयर यान स्पेशली फॉर महेश्वरी साड़ीज एंड ऑल वॉज क्वाइट सॉर्ट आफ्टर um so so on the one hand you have women spinners uh, widely uh, i mean distributed and then you also have a very spe- specialist male parayar spinners um so coming to uh, weaving prior to weaving there was a lot of um, you know preparation that had to be done before the final weaving happens and all this preparatory work was done by women um so while the male weaver this i'm talking about south india it is very different uh, in uh, northeast india where uh, you know women are the primary weavers or for example in china where again women are the primary weavers and there are many uh, i mean so it differs across the world as to you know who uh, whether the male or the female is the primary in south india it was mo- mostly men who wove there was no i mean at least i haven't found an active uh, uh, what do you say um ban on women weaving uh, but women were involved in the preparatory processes and so while one cloth was being woven the other cloth had to be prepared and this took a long time first of all you know the the yarn had to be collected and then the yarn had to be uh, warped so warping is the forming of the you know the 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 threads the lengthwise threads and so that had to be warped and for warping uh, generally women did this outside the house and there were certain sticks that were put into the ground and women literally had to walk up and down up and down uh, twisting the thread between these sticks that were put in the ground so they walked kilometers and kilometers and often this was done in groves and um, done collectively i mean collectively in the sense uh, you know women working at the same time and so on then uh, the, it had to be warped then it had to be mended it had to be sized and finally it had to be put on the loom and then again the weft threads which are used cross cross in the yarn also have to be put on spindles uh, so that again was done by women and the, the, there is also evidence to show that you know uh, while men kind of did most of the weaving um, women also stepped in you know when there was a need so when the man was out or in the evening and this goes undocumented so um but even if you consider that, okay that the men were weaving the whole preparatory process which was i mean the amount of labor that went into it was and the time that went into it was equal to uh, the final cloth being produced was done by women so so this whole labor was kind of um organized around the household and uh, i mean you see the tensions in this Uh, when you know the systems are changing so for for example when uh, warping becomes mechanized simple mechanization not uh, uh, not anything very sophisticated but it moves out of uh, the weaver's household then there is a resistance to it because usually you know the kind of wage that was paid to the weaver included a kind of uh, amount uh, for warp- warping right um and uh, similarly for um i mean i have already said how spinning uh, the mechanization of spinning just took away that uh, that whole uh, important aspect and important income from uh, so many households um and so but then what kind of transformation do we see in this period uh, the transformation we see is that on the one hand uh, spinning uh, gets mechanized and therefore you know uh, uh, women are i mean an important income for women is lost now this is often dismissed as you know they were anyway weaving were earning very little and so what does it matter you know i mean it was a drudgery etc uh, etc et but there's also work from uh, europe and from britain in particular uh, which also shows that you know uh, how even this small income was very very important Uh, income to the household and also to the women um, and uh, in the case of england there is a lot of documentation to show how widows and spinsters often you know just survived on that income right so uh, so i would say that you know while not glorifying or romanticizing spinning uh, one needs to recognize uh, this uh, i mean what happens in this transformation um uh, on the other hand uh, if you look at uh, i mean the modern handloom industry itself one does find that uh, on the one hand uh, women continue to be in the subordinate uh, or in the secondary 
kind of processes that they are paid much less. So say in warping, when warping becomes mechanized, then mostly it's women who are working in the warping. Uh, similarly, in the homes, they continue to do, you know, the um, spinning of the weft thread and uh, the kind of um, other kind of secondary uh, things around weaving. Um, there is a small proportion of women who also then enter weaving. Um, often, you know, uh, having a second loom in the house or uh, working on the loom when the male weaver is not working. And then where the workshops are set up, what I found was that while initially it was all dominated by male weavers with the households um, only, I mean, helping that male weaver. Uh, from the 1970s, which is outside my book, actually, outside the period that I cover in the book, uh, as male weavers left the workshop or the factory sector, they got replaced by female weavers, by women weavers. So when, uh, you know, weaving became less lucrative and there were other jobs where men could earn more and they left the handroom, that is when they were replaced by uh, women. Uh, another important thing that has been observed by many people working on handrooms is that often, even when the work moved to, say, the workshop, um, uh, household dynamics moved with it. Right. So um, in the running of the workshop, for example, that uh, the, the person who runs the workshop, then his wife also, you know, uh, does several things of organizing things in the workshop. Or if there is a weaver, then the person who is preparing the weft threads, uh, sitting in the corner and preparing the weft threads and getting it ready for the weaver is either his wife or his daughter. Um, and so on. So, you know, often household dynamics, even when it was no more situated in the household, moved to the uh, workshop or the um, or the factory uh, now moving to uh, how how does uh, how did caste shape uh, or what role did it play in this transformation uh, i think that's one of the interesting things that um, came out of my research and which is something that has not uh, been really looked at uh, before this um, because, you know, uh, almost all work um, was focused on uh, the so-called specialist weavers. So the moment you ask anybody uh, in Karnataka or Tamil Nadu, or who are the weavers, what are the castes, then, you know, they will give you a list of names, oh, the Saurashtras, the Saliyars, um, and so on. So, um, and so these are the names also who you find in, uh, in the work of historians as well. And there was a very strong emphasis that no no uh, in india unlike say china um, weaving was a specialist occupation right so people didn't do it part time being peasants and weavers it was not and therefore women don't do, didn't do it part time but this was a specialist where weavers were only weavers they did not farm and so on and so forth um, and so there were these specialist weaving castes who you know produced all this cloth but when I went to the archive, I found, I mean, these large numbers of uh, weavers uh, who belong to the Dalit caste. So like the Parayars, the Malas, the Koliars, um, and so on. So I was like, but these are weavers. I've never heard that Parayars are weavers. Uh, I mean, in, in North India, you do uh, have at least an understanding that, yes, you know, Chamars were often categorized as weavers. In South India, in, especially in Tamil Nadu, you don't hear that. So in the, in the first place, it was a huge surprise. Then when I tried putting all the numbers together, it looked like almost 20 to 30 percentage of the number, I mean, the number of weavers in all these lists in many, especially in many of the districts. So it varied from district to district. And interestingly, it was in the districts where cotton was produced and where, you know, uh, coarse kinds of cloth were uh, woven more widely and there was a wider access to yarn. You find many, many more uh, Dalit weavers. So in Coimbatore, Madurai, in the Deccan, Kadappa, uh, all these districts, you find more uh, Dalit weavers. So then my thing was, okay, then, but what happened to them, right? Um, and you look at the kind of records in the 1930s or 40s or 60s, 50s, 60s, uh, suddenly they are not there uh, in all those categorization. Um, if at all they are there, it's one minuscule number, and they are often represented as uh, new entrants, right, uh, to the industry. So, so this was a big question to me: what happened to these Dalit weavers? And it was clear that they are part-time weavers. Often they were just agricultural laborers, um, and they produced coarse kinds of cloth. So, in some historical literature, it had been noticed, but they had been kind of 
dismissed as you know these part time weavers they were part time weavers who produced coarse cloth but coarse cloth was what the majority of the population wore um and that's something again i mean by looking at all these textile samples i i realized that you know a plain coarse durable cloth was what everybody wore so that means you know they produced a very important kind of cloth and not just they produced so the people who you would think of today as specialist weavers who are the kai collars uh, in the 19th century they are called kai collars and uh, later on now they are called as sengunda mudakliyars in tamil nadu they wove the same kinds of cloth as the parayar weavers uh, so 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 what happens to them so they clearly disappear by the 1930s 40s so this was something that you know i had to try and figure out why do they disappear uh, and so then what i the way i went about doing and also trying to understand what role caste played in this whole uh, transformation is to compare the parayar weavers with a um, another uh, group of weavers who are considered as specialist uh, weavers like the saurashtra weavers right uh i mean they were called the pattunul karars in the 19th century and they have an interesting very long history of migration all the way from saurashtra down to madurai over centuries and getting settled in madurai in the nayaka period so they are considered specialist weavers their very name suggests that you know they used to weave silk so um so i tried comparing the trajectory of these two and then um, to answer my question why did the parayar weavers disappear i think it was a combi combination or at least i argue that it was a combination of factors uh, one of the factors being technology uh, which is the shift i mean so so spinning moves out of the hands of you know uh, so many people and it becomes centralized so now you need capital in order to be able to buy yarn you can't just get it from somebody um, and then give them a piece of cloth uh, so so the transformation of the spinning technology on the one hand and also the transformation of weaving technology so as Uh, in the late 19th century when the handloom industry is really struggling what comes to its rescue in many ways is the fly shuttle so the fly shuttle uh, speeds up the process of um, of uh, weaving uh, so the the shuttle basically can uh, move from end to end very quickly um, so this is introduced over the course of the um, early i mean late 19th early 20th century and this was a simple technology it didn't mean that you needed a lot of capital uh, to invest in it but still there are calculations to show that it needed some capital right um similarly getting yarn needed some capital and then this whole shift towards uh, you know la- urban centers this need to be connected to uh, weaver capitalists or merchants who would then also help you sell the cloth in uh, markets uh, so in this whole process uh, at least um, i i argue that it's possible that Uh, the dalit weavers did not have both the financial capital and the social social capital to make this transformation an added factor is the fact that in order to survive in order to you know uh, be able to uh, continue to be handloom weavers weavers also then shifted the kind of cloth that they were producing so the first cloth kind of cloth to be uh, you know kind of finished off by competition from the mills was the coarse thick durable plain kind of cloth right because that was the easiest to be produced by machines so they uh, invariably uh, replaced the kind of coarse durable cloth that uh, most of the weavers were producing what the in, the mills found more difficult to imitate were the finer kinds of cloth the more patterned kinds of cloth so there like sarees um, and you know patterned kinds of sarees so you clearly see and this is something everybody acknowledges in the records at that time and later historians um, and actually you know highlight it as one of the dynamic ways in which the handloom industry managed to adapt is by shifting you know from ordinary plain kinds of cloth to more uh, complicated fancy and then also mixing artificial silk so on and so forth um and that's how they survived so but for that you needed uh, to learn new skills right uh, you needed new kind of social capital which uh, was easier say for kai collar weavers um, who earlier produced cloths which were similar to the parayar weavers but you know they had the necessary social connections to be able to make that shift right uh, whereas parayar weavers could not make that shift so 
caste here plays a very important role in combination with technological change, in combination with um, policies, et cetera, uh, and other economic forces to determine what happens to one set of people. Now, the same forces act differently for the Patanulkaras, right? the Saurashtra weavers, where they manage to make the transformation. Uh, so there, like the city of Madurai is quite well documented for that period. And you see that there is a much greater internal differentiation among the Saurashtra weavers. So you find you know, a very small layer who, uh, who have enough capital, who become merchants, who get very interested in dyeing uh, processes, new chemical dyes. They learn all that. They apply it to you know, the kind of cloths they were producing before. Um, and um, then there is a whole middle range uh, who act as intermediaries. And then there is a um, the largest population is, of course, of ordinary weavers and also women who, in the case of Patanul Karas, do this tie and dye specific kind of uh, cloth production. Um, and um, I mean, so Tritankar Roy also writes um, about this community, um, highlighting this whole dynamism of that community because they, they lend money uh, within the community, right? They support. Uh, weavers of their own community. So they set up schools um, and so on and so forth. But it's exactly that social capital uh, which uh, allows them as a whole to survive, but not necessarily, you know, uh, that survival being, um, what do you say, um, a, a success for everybody. Of course, it was a success for the uh, weaver capitalists at the top, but it was not necessarily a success for uh, the people at the bottom, right? Uh, so even there, you have to differentiate the stories of the different kinds of weavers. But it is clearly this caste capital, social capital, which uh, influences the different trajectories uh, of the Parayar weavers on the one hand and the Saurashtra weavers on the other. And then you can study the other uh, weavers belonging to different communities as well. So I think this is an important thing that has been in, uh, ignored uh, in historiography and, and yeah, needs to be acknowledged and looked at. So could you also explain a little bit about how the book traces critical conjectures when social, economic, and political forces came together to reshape the lives of the weavers in, you know, some fundamental ways? Uh, yeah, okay. In many ways, I think I've just uh, kind of yeah. answered partly that. So uh, so actually, the two examples that I would give for that to look at critical conjunctures would be one, this late 19th century, early 20th century, what happens to Parayar weavers vis-a-vis -vis what happens to uh, Saurashtra weavers, right? Um, so so that in that story, you can see different conjunctures playing out in different ways. Um, so, so you, I mean, just to kind of summarize that, so uh, you can see on the one hand, you know, the international forces that have kind of led to this whole uh, situation where uh, there is a competition from uh, large scale industry. Um, in the late 19th century, it's still primarily from Britain. And even in the early 20th century, still primarily from Britain. And the Indian industry, uh, mill industry is also kind of catching up. Uh, so, so here are the international forces that are playing a role in shaping uh, what's going on. Uh, then there is technology. Right, which is shaping what's going on, the spinning and the, the fly shuttle, uh, the new kind of dyes that are coming in and so on. Um, and then you have uh, state policy, which is uh, playing a role. So in the 19th century, the, uh, the colonial state had a you know, uh, free market policy, so to say, which meant that we will not do anything. We will not lift a finger to protect anything here. So if you're know, if you being flooded by imports, yeah, sorry, that's uh, how it is. Um, in the 20th century, things change a little bit because there is also pressure uh, from the, in the, in the national movement. There is pressure from the mill sector for greater protection. Uh, so then some tariffs are introduced and so on. And then also um, at another level, there is a push uh, that you know we need to 
at least in Madras presidency, that you know we need to also look at small scale industry. There are small small efforts to uh, you know set up model factories, and there are a few officials like Havel and Chatterton who are you know trying to figure out how these small industries can be supported. And so uh, this whole thing of introducing the fly shuttle also, for example, is actually quite a state initiative, right? Uh, so so there is there there is the state that is getting involved, um, and then as I as I highlighted, there is the household that is uh, you know involved then there is how uh, caste is playing a role there right and uh, so all of these different uh, factors are kind of meeting together but are affecting different kinds of weavers in different ways so they are affecting parayar weavers differently saurashtra weavers differently then within saurashtra weavers they are affecting uh, you know the weaver capitalist differently from the ordinary wage weaver differently so uh, so I think there is a need to have this nuanced approach and not to look at, you know, just what's happening to the handloom industry. Did it get destroyed uh, or did it, you know, uh, was it dynamic and it survived, right? Whereas you need to look at what is happening to women, men, spinners, weavers, different kinds of weavers and so on. And look at how the different, and sometimes one factor is more in one context, more important than another factor, right? So, so, so that is how I would apply it to the story of the Parahir weavers and the Saurashtra weavers. Now, if we want, if I would take a second example, uh, then, uh, you know, one could come to the uh, 1940s, uh, 50s, which is another period that I kind of look at, um, where um, I, I mean, where one could examine the role of uh, played by legislation, right, to shape the whole uh, I mean, to shape the handloom industry, but then I also kind of broaden it out to see how does it shape the whole uh, informal sector, so to say. So um, as I already kind of uh, said uh, towards the beginning, um, do does the handloom industry become, you know, uh, from household to factory, then from handloom factory to powerloom factory? So is there a kind of straight path like that? Or does it take different forms? Um, it does take different forms. Uh, so you have a whole range. Uh, you have uh, independent weavers, you have weavers working for master weavers, but from home, they're owning their own uh, loom, et cetera. Then you have weavers working in small workshops in slightly larger factories. And then finally, later on, you also have the uh, cooperatives, the weavers working in the cooperatives. So a whole range emerges. And uh, if you compare, for example, Tamil Nadu to uh, Western Maharashtra, which is the region that Haynes has studied, uh, the factory is less predominant in, 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 Tamil, in the Tamil Nadu region and even in the Andhra region uh, than it is in um, Western, uh, Western India. Um, so here what predominates is more, uh, there are factories, but uh, the predominant form is the uh, weavers working from their homes. So, so then the question would arise, why? Why are there different patterns? What are the different factors? How do they intersect uh, you know, uh, to produce these different outcomes. Uh, so again, uh, in this case also, you can look at the whole range of all that is, you know, affecting them, including technology, uh, international uh, trades, economic trends, uh, national level policies, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, for this period, I have kind of uh, looked particularly at the uh, how this, all these other forces intersect with uh, labor politics, uh, with the kind of, uh, what do you say, uh, the political power or of uh, small scale capital and the state and how these play out in shaping uh, the uh, structure of the handling industry. Uh, so uh, not just shop floor um, uh, politics, which I already talked about and which Haynes talks about, uh, wherein you know the the kind of conflicts and negotiations between weavers and um, and weaver capitalists uh, kind of shapes uh, the everyday uh, production systems, but also the larger politics. So in the th in at least in uh, South India, you find uh, weavers organizing themselves um, as trade unions and uh, pushing for greater protection and for labor laws that are being applied to larger industries to also be applied to them um, and so on. So they, so, so, so they are pushing for that and the 
uh, the the small scale capitalists or beaver capitalists are pushing against it and are arguing with the state that you know um, ours is a, a small scale sector we don't have the capacity to um, you know absorb the kind of costs that will increase if uh, new legislations protective legislations are introduced so they push back right uh, so and all this back and forth also leads to the development of the cooperative sector so uh, on the one hand it is a state initiative trying to initiate cooperatives uh, but when it comes top down from the state it's not it's barely successful and the state is also initially the colonial state is not willing to you know uh, put in um, much resources uh, into the whole process and uh, it really picks up or you know gets a push when the pressure is from below um, and uh, so one way that the state kind of responds to the crisis of weavers and the kind of mobilization amongst weavers um, is to then you know uh, facilitate the setting up of cooperatives uh, on the one hand and on the other hand kind of uh, allowing big loopholes for handloom uh, handloom weaving i mean handloom factory owners to escape uh, legal scrutiny, right? Uh, so, which then leads to the in the handloom industry being in the informal sector, so without any protection, without uh, state scrutiny, and so on. So that doesn't happen naturally. Uh, it, it is an outcome of this three-cornered politics between handloom weavers, uh, you know, small-scale capitalists, and the state. Uh, so, it is the outcome of this politics that. Uh, gives us in the 1960s, 70s, on the one hand, cooperatives, on the other hand, uh, you know, small scale factories, which are in the, or become part of the informal sector. Um, and so, which then shape the larger economy uh, where the informal sector also dominates uh, in the Indian scene. So, so that would be another conjuncture, uh, an example for another conjuncture. And uh, what has been the role of the state uh, in uh, promoting the handloom industry? Uh, if you could talk about the relationship between state and private capital in this context. Yeah, okay. So I actually just already kind of came to that. So it will, I can kind of organically move on to that. So, um, yeah, so the state has actually been ignored in a lot of revisionist historiography. Um, while it played, I mean, while it had a very domineering presence in nationalist or Marxist historiography. So because uh, in the original, I mean, nationalist historiography, handlooms were destroyed and they were destroyed because of the colonial state, right? And uh, industrialization in India took the shape it took because the colonial state refused to, you know, uh, promote industrialization and you know the skewed industrialization was because of the policies of the colonial state so colonial state was the enemy uh, to blame for everything now in revisionist historiography the market often took the place um, of the state right so it was the market dynamism that uh, shaped uh, the transformation of the handloom industry uh, gave it a certain dynamic flip and uh, um, enabled it to adapt and uh, survive and even uh, flourish, and not just survive. Uh, so I feel that, you know, uh, this uh, ignoring the state uh, in this way uh, is problematic. And uh, the, I think the state played a very important role in shaping uh, the handloom industry and how it survived. So, and I would argue that, I mean, it was not necessarily just through support. So when we think of handlooms, we uh, always kind of think of cooperatives and think of subsidies and uh, the way, you know, um, and, and a lot of it is also be, has been because of the influence of Gandhian um, ideas uh, with the setting up of Khadi and all that, that, you know, uh, these kind of artisanal and traditional, so-called traditional industries, uh, should be supported by the state and um, so on. Uh, so while there has been an element of that, um, I would say that is not the primary or the uh, most important role that has been played by the state. And um, the other thing, so, so, so the kind of conjuncture that I spoke about uh, clearly shows that 
um, you know, this, what the state was doing was not just its own initiative. It was not saying, oh, yes, yes, we see that, you know, we have to protect handrooms. Let's go and protect them. But the, the, the state did what it did because of the different kinds of pressures that were acting on it. And it had to take decisions uh, while engaging with these pressures. So, so there is very clear evidence of pressure from uh, from the from small capital. Uh, so, so there are different kinds of pressure. On the one hand, there is small capital, uh, not just handloom weavers. You find the same happening with BD industry or with the leather industry. The small scale capital kind of uh, telling the state that you know you need to protect us. You need to uh, facilitate. Uh, industrial development so you need to facilitate so there's there are advertisements which i have found you know where they are campaigning that you know um, handlooms are the best and uh, the state needs to you know uh, protect it and there are petitions uh, to the state that you know the state shouldn't hound us shouldn't bring in new legislation which restrict us shouldn't bring in labor legislation which would increase our co costs so uh, we are all you know small men uh, who need to uh, who's who need to be protected and whose work needs to be facilitated not you know restricted and so you know so 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 these kind of appeals on the one hand and they had their representatives in the legislative assembly so if you look at the legislative assembly debates they are very much there right um arguing against labor laws arguing for certain kinds of policies and even even before that in the 1920s 30s you find uh the so-called leading men of the handloom industry, together with everybody else, you know, uh, all the all the weavers in the handloom industry, campaigning for things like, uh, say, yarn prices or uh, tariffs uh, on imported yarn, um, things like that, right? Which which are which are matters that affect the whole industry as a whole. It's not about wages or what the weaver is earning. This is about things that affect the industry as a whole. Or during the war. There is a lot of black, black marketing, Second World War, black marketing happening and all that. So uh, about that or about the quality of yarn that is being provided by mills or how mills are sometimes not providing the yarn that they should be providing or that they are jacking up prices. So all these kind of issues was collectively uh, kind of brought up, campaigned. And so leading men, so to say, of the industry took up these issues. Um, so small, small capital, then collective mobilization amongst the whole weaving community. Then you also find, as I already said, trade unions. So weavers are in this period also mobilizing. So, so it's not like only in this period suddenly weavers start mobilizing. They have been mobilizing in the 19th century, but in different ways. And that's one of the things that I look at in the book. But in the 30s and 40s, they start mobilizing as trade unions where they are campaigning for uh, you know better wages for uh, labor laws to be applied to the handloom industry and so on so so you find all these different actors uh, interacting with each other and whatever state policy emerges emerges out of that context out of those pressures so on the one hand for example they pass the labor legislation and they do say okay let it apply to the handloom industry as well as long as it's you know of a certain size and all that but then they, they leave enough loopholes uh, that will ensure that you know most of the handloom industry uh, is not covered by legislation right so so that is the way in which the state acts and that as i said already shapes uh, the very fact that the handloom industry has ended up in the informal sector and uh, did not, you know, follow this trajectory of being small scale to larger factories to even larger factories or power looms, right? And uh, to take uh, an even more uh, uh, interesting example of the same thing, uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, the power loom sector uh, kind of kicks in much, much later than in Western India. So in Western India, this you find very quickly handloom moving to power loom. And there again, uh, state policy plays a very important role. And the state in, uh, Tam in uh, Tamil Nadu brings in all sorts of uh, policy measures to ensure that you know, handloom is protected and power looms are not given as much space. And this, it doesn't do uh, of its just because it thinks that that's a good idea, but there is a clear, you know, I found petitions from cooperatives from handloom associations telling the state, you know, uh, don't allow uh, power looms, don't give them permissions, and so on and so forth. So, you, so whereas on the other hand, you find 
uh, economic advisors. Again, I found these records, economic advisors telling the state, listen, you're going to miss the bus, right? You're not, you're not taking up power looms. Uh, all the other states will, you know, uh, tra transition to power looms and we'll be left behind. So, you know, let's bring in power looms. Why don't you bring in power looms within the cooperative sector, right? So all these policy measures are being uh, thought about, but then there is a backlash. So, so you really find this dynamics that is happening, which influences state policy, uh, which in turn shapes the handloom industry. And just a last thing about the state, is that even the state, I think, is not a monolithic structure. So it doesn't mean, you know, the state does X, Y, Z. Uh, within the state, you find a lot of a similar kind of process or dynamism dialogue. So there's a big difference between Madras presidency and the central colonial state. Uh, often they are very divergent in what the, the view they take on uh, handlooms or small scale industry. Um, there's quite a lot of work to show that, you know, in, in Madras, there was a push for uh, for encouraging small scale industry, handloom industry. There was this official called Chatterton. Before him, there was this official called Havel. And in my book, I look at how, you know, even Havel and Chatterton had uh, different opinions about uh, you know, economic development and the future of small scale industry and handlooms and so on. And so, so, so there is a lot of um, debate and the outcomes are influenced by these debates. Uh, so whether it is between Madras presidency and the col central colonial state or within the Madras presidency, there's no one voice uh, or one action by the state. It's an outcome of uh, different kinds of debates, different kinds of pressures acting uh, both within and outside the state. Uh, but I think all that needs to be looked at and the state should not be ignored or dismissed. Right. Uh, last question, Karuna. So uh, how have legislations to protect handloom workers historically developed? And if you think that there is a dichotomy that exists between a weaver and a worker? Okay, so maybe I'll take your second question first. Uh, it's an interesting question. And um, uh, I would say that, you know, uh, so, so I have also often struggled while writing, for example, writing the book. Do I use the word weaver? Do I use the word worker? And do I use the word weaver in the 19th century and then maybe move on to using the word worker in the 20th century, in the 1920s or 30s? If so, why? Um, and I think this problem has to do uh, more with the way the, the way the term worker has come to be defined, right? So, um, so today we, uh, when the moment somebody says worker, immediately the image is of um, a person who's working in a factory or, uh, or even a person who's working in an agricultural field, but it is someone who's working exclusively for wages and it, someone who's working for somebody else, there is an uh, and doesn't own their own their means of production, so to say, right? Uh, so since since worker is de defined so narrowly, um, when you say weaver, um, I mean not all weavers would be uh, categorized as workers, especially when you go earlier in the period where you see the weaver as more, you know an independent artisan who's weaving in their own home, who's selling their own cloth. Uh, so, so it's difficult for you to use the term worker because of the connotations that it has. And as you know, we will start resembling more our definition of worker, uh, you start you, and especially they're forming trade unions, uh, they are working in a factory, they are working for an employer, then, you, then one tends to use the term uh, worker more often. Uh, but I feel, you know, there is a problem here. And uh, why why should, you know, a weaver working in their own home also not be a worker? It is, and it's one of the reasons why then so many people who actually work and who are workers are dismissed, right? Even in the, who, who do you recognize as a worker? So women doing so many different kinds of work, unpaid work, are they not workers, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, there is this work by Marcel van der Linden, uh, who is a worker? 
um so this is it's a fantastic article which kind of says that you know we need to stop thinking in these narrow terms and broaden our definitions of worker um not just people working for a wages for an employer or worker there are so many different kinds of worker even people who are self employed who are doing different things who are selling it even they are workers um different kinds of women doing unpaid but they are workers so you need to broaden your definition of workers and in that way you know uh we can break down this dichotomy so so while i feel that because of the way it's defined that seems to be a dichotomy there is a need to push and uh, break this uh, kind of dichotomy um coming to your earlier question about law i think i already also touched upon it um and legislation uh so yeah so on the one hand uh there is uh, so called protective legislation um so which starts quite late uh, so the colonial state mostly had a policy of non interference with market forces but because of the uh, increasing kind of pressure put on it by uh, the nationalist movement and so on um it started bringing in legislation for example tariffs to protect the mill industry uh, then uh, uh, because those tariffs you know affected the price of imported yarn uh, which actually then made it worse for handloom weavers there was pressure to provide a kind of counter uh compensation for handloom weavers which then led to a uh, suggestion that you know it, that fund be put into setting up of cooperatives so slowly the state gets more and more involved now one of the main demands in that period uh, from uh, the as i said the leading men of the handloom industry was to protect specific kinds of cloth that were produced by handloom weavers against competition from mill so it was like you categorize cloths uh, let some be reserved for the handloom industry and the rest can be um, produced by the mill industry now the colonial state was very resistant to this you know or uh, this kind of um, intervention but uh, after independence um, um, many of the states and also the central government uh, brought in those kind of legislation so reserving certain kinds of cloth um for uh, handlooms it, it has not been a very successful policy because then how do you monitor you know often if there is a false categorization of mill produced cloth as handloom cloth and so on and even now you have that policy continuing with these special kind of marks for uh, handloom cloth so so that was one way in which um the uh, state tried protecting uh, the handloom industry other ways were also you know kind of uh, ensuring that mills provided the yarn that was necessary for the handloom industry because handloom industry needs certain counts of yarn certain kinds of yarn in certain quantities and also in in a certain form so um while power looms need yarn you know in a when they are rolled on kind of spindles um what handlooms need is called hank yarn where you know they are in hanks and not rolled like that so mills were refusing to provide that so then you know the state had to step in to ensure that they are provided in that way and so on so 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 these are kind of measures which you would say uh, kind of protect the whole industry as such right and uh, cooperatives is part of that same measure so some states some states like tamil nadu andhra maharashtra went in for um, encouraging cooperatives and especially in periods of crisis so in the case of south in south india erstwhile madras presidency 1953 was a, 1948 there was a crisis but then 1953 there was a huge crisis uh, where then the government st state stepped in to kind of give a push to uh, cooperatives um now coming to legislation which is not necessarily protective or it is not protective of the industry as a whole uh i still feel the state played a very important role and i've already touched on this which is you know uh, the kind of legislation that were brought in for uh, the protection of labor and there what the state did was basically uh, allow small scale industries to kind of escape that uh, protection right uh, though there was there was demands that you know legislation be brought in to protect labors in small scale industry and in madras presidency there was a push and actually there was a law that came up which was called the non power factories act which was passed uh, with a lot of loopholes uh, but then you know that was over uh, ridden by uh, the central legislation and finally through a slightly longer process which i have examined uh, in a later paper uh, 
all these uh, you know handloom factories and other people like those working in leather and bd factories also kind of uh, were kind of pushed out of any kind of legal purview so their law actually played a role in failing to protect uh, workers weavers in the handloom industry so that's an important way in how law shaped the whole process well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Karuna, for discussing the book and having this conversation with us. It was a very uh, thorough and detailed take on your book. And I hope that uh, our listeners and viewers now go back to the book and read it uh, if they have not. And for those who have already read it, I hope the discussion is a supplement to what you have read. So thank you so much for taking time out. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Uh, to revisit my book after break <laughs> so and thank you for the very interesting questions which also prodded me to think uh, more about it thank you